It really is a privilege and a pleasure to be here. This uh, two and a half years ago, I spoke uh, before the Global Science Convention in Orlando, Florida, and very honestly, uh, to our astonishment, uh, we were absolutely mobbed afterward. Uh, uh, we have a major breakthrough here. Uh, I think I'll give you a little background on how this all developed to begin with. In 1975 is when the initial breakthroughs were made in Phoenix, Arizona. Prior to that, uh, just to give you a little quick history on myself, I had spent uh, about 15 years in the insurance industry. Don't hold that against me, by the way. Very successful career, financially, certainly. Uh, retired out of the business at the age of 34, a millionaire, uh, and left, actually, an income of over a million dollars a year when I walked away from the business in 1974. For two years, my last two years in that industry, uh, I had been having reoccurring dreams uh, and it got to the point where it was actually flashing in my mind during my waking hours as well, that there was something else calling me, something else I should be doing with my life, and it became so prevalent without my knowing exactly what it was that in fact I just decided I must leave that business to find out what the answer to that question was. I moved out in the desert uh, in Arizona, about 40 miles northeast of Phoenix, up against the Superstition Mountains, and my closest neighbor was about three and a half miles away from me, so I was pretty isolated. I spent a lot of time over the next year in the Superstition Mountains and also out on the desert, and just doing a lot of what I called in those days soul searching to find out what it was that was calling me. In uh, 1975, about a year later, I was led into Phoenix, mentally led into Phoenix, and told that the answer was there. Uh, I searched for about 30 days, uh, going around different parts of the city, meeting people, talking to people in business and so on, and eventually ended up buying a speed reading company. I, I knew absolutely nothing about speed reading, by the way. That's what's so, so bizarre about all of this. I'd never even taken a speed reading course in my life, and uh, so it was, it was truly off the charts for me as to why in the world I would have bought a speed reading company at that time but I certainly know why today. Within about 30 days after buying that speed reading company, I became not, uh, not only a speed reader and knew a little bit about the industry, but I also became very disillusioned with what I saw happening in the speed reading industry. And I'm giving you this background to let you know how and why all of this has developed. I. Uh, found that an enormous percentage of people that go through speed reading courses, not only mine but others, regressed back to reading very rapidly after they went through speed reading courses. And in fact, I went out across the country and interviewed over 5,000 people that within the last year had graduated from different speed reading courses and found that over 90% of them had regressed back to reading within uh, six weeks after graduating out of speed reading courses. And that just didn't make sense to me. It didn't logic out at all because speed reading worked. I knew that for a fact. Comprehension is better, retention is better for when you speed read, plus you're saving time. And that wasn't just statistics coming out of the speed reading industry. That was coming from the National Education Association. It was pretty much across the board. Speed reading works. The problem was, why? Why were people regressing? Why were people not holding on to this skill when in fact it worked and in many cases they'd spend hundreds of dollars to learn how to speed read? And what I kept hearing when I asked that question to people over and over again went something like this. They would say, gosh, I'm no longer saying all the words to myself like I do when I read. I'm no longer sub-vocalizing, if you will, all the words. So I must be skimming and scanning. And if I'm skimming and scanning, I'm not getting it all, so I better go back to reading. And what they were doing was literally talking themselves out of using this skill that they had learned called speed reading. Now, that really didn't make sense to me at the time. Of course, I was a real, real neophyte when it came to the mind, and I still am today, by the way. I, uh, uh, I readily admit that. The more I learn about the brain, the more I know I don't know. But the fact is, in those days, I didn't even know what the subconscious was. That was a foreign word to me. I came out of a very structured lifestyle. <laughs> Uh, at any rate, now I know today that the conscious mind was literally talking these people out of using this skill. My next question following that was, 
I wonder what's happening to all these words when you speed read that are no longer being subvocalized because you're coming down the page at such a speed it's physically impossible to subvocalize or say all the words to yourself as you do when you read. And those words that are not being subvocalized, my thought was, gosh, maybe they're being utilized within the brain somehow, and that's why comprehension is better and retention is better. I went around to the heads of different speed reading companies, including Evelyn Woods herself, who developed speed reading following World War II, and asked that question. What happens to the words that are no longer being subvocalized? And the answer was, I don't know. I didn't have an answer that was positive on, from anyone in the industry. No one had ever taken the time to find out the answer to that question. So I set out, being a real neophyte, not an educator, uh, not a psychologist, I didn't realize things couldn't be done. And so I set out to find out what does happen to these words that are no longer being subvocalized. I think they're actually being used in the brain. I set up pilot classes in my schools in Phoenix and ranged initially from age 9 to age 72, later on from 5 to 92. And in those classes, we had varying IQs, varying learning disabilities represented, uh, certainly varying age brackets, and varying socioeconomic backgrounds. And I uh, instructed my instructors to take these people faster and faster and faster through the material to eliminate more and more subvocalizing and measure very specifically through written tests what the results would be as they went faster and faster and eliminated more and more of the subvocalizing. And lo and behold, the direct correlation came about very rapidly. Comprehension was better and retention was longer as subvocalizing uh, sub was eliminated. And once we got to the point where it was physically impossible to subvocalize any words on the page, and therefore it was physically impossible really to focus on the page, that was the reason for it, and this happens at approximately two pages per second, at that speed, uh, the comprehension peaked and the retention became 100%. Now what had happened at that point was the sensations of reading had completely disappeared. There was no subvocalizing involved at all. There was no saying of the words to ourselves involved. There was no focusing on the page required at all. Therefore, it was unnecessary to wear glasses it bypassed problems like dyslexia, and certainly bypassed 99%, if you will, of all the learning disabilities that we know of, because they're all conscious level disabilities. What had happened was, we had opened up a direct path through the brain to a very specific part of the subconscious part of the brain, which was literally taking a verbatim picture of the information as it went by at the rate of two pages a second or faster. Now, we did not stop at those speeds of two pages a second. We didn't know any better at that time. So we continued on, and it became literally a dexterity page-turning contest. But we continued on up until we bypassed the existing world's record in speed reading of 100,000 words a minute. Then we went beyond 200,000, 300,000, 400,000, 500,000. And eventually a young boy, 14-year-old boy by the name of Larry Maper in Phoenix, Arizona, actually Mesa, Arizona, peaked out at an amazing 606,000 words per minute, physically turning pages. Now that takes a book that turns pages very easily, and it also takes a book that's very small print and has a lot of words per page. And that book happened to be the book Ben-Hur, which he went through in 30 seconds. <laughs> Now, Larry did this in front of 30 educators at our school in Phoenix and then took a 100-question written test, true-false, multiple choice, fill-in, matching questions, and essay questions that these educators had put together on that book and scored 90% on the test. What was probably more remarkable than the fact that Larry was able to turn pages at that speed, which was very remarkable, and the fact that he could score 90% on that test was that Larry Maper was a dyslexic. Larry Maper had read one book in his entire life. Larry Maper was a D minus student in school waiting for the day he was 16 years old and could drop out with his parents' blessing, by the way, because he had put, been put down all of his life as a non-learner, a slow learner, 
a real misfit in the educational system, and so on. The next semester, Larry went back to, to high school, still in his freshman year, and completed his entire semester's curriculum in all of his subjects in two weeks with straight A's. Three semesters later, Larry, Larry Maper graduated from high school a straight A honor student. And Larry wasn't alone. Uh, we had many others that were doing the same thing. So many in the Mesa Central High School, in fact, at the time that they set up a special award for the top speed reader, as they called it, and we did too at that time, in the school. We had several of the faculty that were involved, several that were even teaching for us by that time. And by that time, we had also gone into very extensive testing, uh, all privately funded by myself at Arizona State University. About this same period of time when these breakthroughs were taking place, we were scouring, my staff and myself were scouring the libraries in the Phoenix area, trying to find if anything like this had ever happened on the globe before, and if so, what we could learn from it. We ran across a book written by an individual, uh, an educator in the United States here, by the name of Dr. Verl McBride. Dr. McBride taught at a small college in Missouri. He um, actually, uh, in 1959, had developed a system similar to what we were doing, still called it speed reading, as we did in those days also, but had actually taken uh, young teenage children over 100,000 words a minute, demonstrated it on live television on NBC, was written up in uh, all the Chicago papers, and had also um, uh, was on Paul Harvey's show several times, got a lot of publicity. And being an educator, he tried to take it to the educational community, which is where it really belongs, in schools. And, of course, it was way before its time, and he was literally uh, chastised in every way you could imagine, and finally uh, left uh, alone the educational community as far as trying to get this incorporated. But he did write a book, and it was called, I think, uh, a beautiful title, Damn the School System, Full Speed Ahead. <laughs> we found this book in the Arizona State University Library, and there aren't too many copies out there, but uh, in that book, Dr. McBride mentioned a man by the name of Georgi Lozanov, Bulgarian scientist who developed what we call in this country super learning, which by the way isn't anything like what Lozanov deals with in Eastern Europe. And also a man by the name of Dr. Herbert Otto. Uh, Dr. Otto, for years, he's now deceased, died in 1980, but Dr. Otto for years ran the foundation for the advancement of human potential in La Jolla, California. And he had a very interesting job, to say the least. He literally, literally traveled the globe, either verifying or discounting advancements in human potential in a variety of different things, and published results on them and so on down the line. Well, I contacted Dr. Otto by phone and uh, told him of what was taking place in Phoenix, what we had seen happening, what was going on. And his initial remark to me was, oh my God, you found it. Now, I didn't really realize what that meant at that time. As a matter of fact, my question back to him was, what have I found? <laughs> and he said, well, you found one of the most powerful forces on the face of the earth. I would rival it to any hydrogen bomb. And the reason I say that to you is that if this is used on a mass basis, it can literally change societies almost overnight. He also uh, told me that it was every bit as powerful a tool negatively as it was positively. And he wanted to know a little bit more about me, the person that had been entrusted with this particular breakthrough, uh, and my background and so on. And after one of the first questions he asked me was, are you a psychologist? And I said, no, and his answer to that was, thank God. <laughs> he then uh, wanted to know if I was in a financial position to, after we had talked for a while, if I was in a financial position to fund the research involved with this myself and protect it completely so that it could not be out here into the wrong hands, if you will. And I said I was, and he was very happy to hear that. And. Uh, through the next 15 years, we did an awful lot of testing and research and development with this process through not only Arizona State University, but the Stanford Research Institute in Palo Alto, California, and a lot of private testing, all of it funded by myself, 
uh, all of it set up so that uh, anyone involved in any particular segment of it, and no one was involved in all of it except myself, uh, that they signed forms that they could never divulge the information, and we have been able to protect it. It's protected the process itself under a trade secret so that no one can duplicate it in this country or Canada, and we're now going globally with it. Um, this process is, we have found uh, so many things over the last few years. Um, to date, over 350 different applications for the use of the part of the brain we tapped into in 1975. It's part of that literally 90% of the brain that's unexplored territory. We have enormous abilities lying within it. And it's almost as if it acts as a conduit to universal knowledge, whatever's out there and available, it's just there. Uh, astounding things happening with people utilizing this and we are now teaching the classes in a format of four three-hour lessons over a four-day span of time we have learned so much about this and, and spent years in fact over five years just simplifying 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 the process and what used to take ten weeks to do now we get about ten times more done in four three-hour sessions in four days the um, the result of this shows, beyond a shadow of a doubt, that anyone can do this. This is a God-given ability we all possess. We were born with it. We never lose it till the day we die. We have simply never been shown how to utilize it. The school system, system certainly don't. Let me give you an idea, very quickly, uh, on the overhead here, of some differences between reading, speed reading, and what we now call subliminal photography. And subliminal photography, by the way, subliminal photography, is, uh, the word subliminal simply means outside of the conscious perception, and of course photography means taking a picture, and that's exactly what we're dealing with in subliminal photography, taking a picture of information outside of the conscious perception. Let's start with reading, though, real quick. Reading, the National Education Association tells us, and we've been able to verify it with over 11,000 people testing out as well, we read at an average of 250 words per minute. Now, what does that mean? There's approximately 300 to 350 words on the normal printed page. So we're reading at a little less than a page per minute. That's the average reading speed of an adult in our society. What's really astonishing is that we only comprehend 50% of what we read immediately after we read it which is the best possible time for us to comprehend anything that we read. That's all we get from reading through one time. Now, this, these statistics are all based upon reading something through one time, not studying it, going over it and over and over it again. We'll get into that in a second. Retention is even more startling because we lose 90% of that 50% we got originally within 48 hours. It's absolutely amazing to me that that's the vehicle for learning that we have in the world today. That's what we're taught to learn through that vehicle. And it's so inefficient and it's stressful. There's a lot of problems with it. Let's go into speed reading very quickly. Speed reading, approximately a thousand words a minute. It doesn't make any really any difference. We just pick that figure out. If you're talking about 800 words a minute, 1,000 words a minute, 5,000 words a minute, or 10,000 words a minute, it's irrelevant. What speed reading is involving and reading is involving are two specific things that must be present. Number one, you must focus on the page. You must focus literally on every word as you read. When you speed read, you're focusing on some of the words because you don't have enough time in coming down the page, depending on how fast you're going, to focus on all of them. And the other thing that's prevalent in both reading and speed reading is subvocalization. You have to say the words to yourself. If you'll stop and think back to when we were taught to read or, or your child or grandchild was taught to read, the teacher starts at one end of the room and, guys, would you get up and uh, little Johnny and, and uh, read the first paragraph to the class out loud. And so he, Johnny gets his turn and then Mary gets her turn and on around the class we go and everybody reads out loud to the class. Then somewhere along the line, the teacher says, now I'd like you all to read to yourselves. The only thing that really changes is that from that point on, we, rather than saying the words outwardly, say them inwardly. And it's called subvocalizing the words rather than vocalizing them. 
in doing that, it's very easy to see. I mean, you can, it's visually easy to see. You can see people's lips move when they read. You can see their Adam's apple move when they read. They're actually saying the words as they read. That's part of reading. Well, what that does is it puts a definite physical limitation on how fast you will ever be able to read. Because the world's fastest talker, according to the Guinness Book of World's Records, is a little over 600 words a minute. So there's no way you're going to read any faster than 600 and some words a minute. That's the fastest. And obviously no one really uh, but that person comes very close to that. The average reader is about 250 words a minute. And interestingly enough, that's the average talking speed as well. So there's a direct correlation there. Speed reading, just the very fact that you are now just subvocalizing some of the words. We're told to subvocalize the most important words on the page when we come down the page in speed reading. But comprehension goes up from going through the material one time. It jumps from 50% to 60%. Pretty substantial increase. Retention, considerably better. Rather than losing 90% of that 50% in 48 hours, you now are able to retain it pretty well for about a week. Then it drops off dramatically. But at least it's certainly much more efficient than reading. Now we get to subliminal photography. Subliminal photography starts at approximately 25,000 words per minute. At 25,000 words per minute, that's uh, a, a page of print that's relatively large print and dealing with the speed of two pages per second. At that speed, subliminal uh, photographing begins uh, and subvocalizing ceases and focusing on the page ceases. So there is no longer a sensation of reading involved. That's the difficult part for the conscious mind to grasp because it doesn't know how to react to that. All it knows is how to react to saying the words, reading, if you will. So it's something new it has to get used to. It takes about three weeks of using it regularly, as it does with any new habit you're forming to do that. Going through the material one time, what we have found is the average comprehension jumps to 77%, considerably higher than reading and speed reading, and the only reason it's not 100% is because when you go through material at the pages of two pages a second in the way books are designed today to read with square corners, you're going to miss pages. You're, it's difficult. You'll find that out very rapidly. Difficult to turn pages every second so that you're seeing two pages each second as it goes by. And the average is that you'll miss 23% of the pages. That's okay. What we have found is if you didn't see it, you didn't get it. So consequently, your comprehension figure is an average of 77% for going through the material one time. What does it take to get it into the 90 percentiles? We have found you need to go through the material three times. If you'll photograph the book three times, you'll miss 23% of the pages every time as an average, but they won't be the same pages. And you'll have seen over 90% of the book after going through it three times, and you will score in the 90 percentiles on tests that you take. What does that mean from a time standpoint? Remember, we're talking about reading at less than one page per minute. We're talking about going through a 120-page book in one minute, a 360-page book in three minutes, going through a 360-page book three times less than 10 minutes, less than the time it would take you to read 10 pages. What's even more startling is in, in this very beginning of this testing, the uh, people involved, the researchers involved, uh, told me that the, the retention factor was showing 100% and it would continue to be 100% for life. Well, I'm from Nebraska originally and that's pretty close to Missouri and I really couldn't buy that right off the bat. That was a little beyond my scope. Uh, and. Uh, but we've been able to measure it now for 17 years, and it's still 100%. So we, I do believe that they were right. And the reasoning is that we had opened up a very specific direct channel through the brain that automatically can be utilized to trigger the information right back out through the same channel. 
We have also developed at least a half a dozen different ways to trigger information back out that a person can do on their own to prove, in fact, every day of their life that they're getting the information they're putting in because they have no sensation consciously that they got it when they photograph it initially. So they need to prove the conscious mind that they're getting it and they can bring it back out at will several different ways. But in addition to that, what happens is as you use the process regularly, it gets to the point where it becomes a natural automatic recall uh, kind of a transaction. Uh, when the information is needed, when a reason is there, a trigger is there to bring the information back out, it automatically surfaces and comes through. Much like a subliminal message does that you're unaware of that you're getting through some form of advertising or whatever. Because the conscious mind, remember, when we're getting messages that way and photographing them subliminally, the conscious mind isn't in the way. It's not blocking anything. It doesn't even know we got the message to begin with, so we automatically react to it when the trigger is there for us to react to it. By the very nature of this process, we have to let the conscious mind know what's going on so it understands that you're photographing the material. And for that reason, it gets in the way real fast because the conscious mind can't do this. And it knows it can't do it. And the conscious mind is where our ego lies. So its immediate reaction is, oh God, this can't be done. And then it little maybe back off a little bit and it's like, well, I suppose it could be done, but I don't know if I could do it. But once you experience it, which this course that we teach is totally experiential, you're doing it every day, even the very first day of class, you're subliminally photographing, you find that you in fact can do it, you can do it very easily. You must maintain the use of the process on a daily basis to some degree each day to keep the channel open. That's imperative. And the only thing that happens for a person not not really locking this skill in is that they don't use the process. That's just that simple. If they do, it works beautifully. And, and how do we know that? Because we get feedback on that every single day from thousands of people all over the country, all over Canada, and now all over the world that have gone through this. Um, we are teaching this literally all over the United States and Canada today. I'm going to open this up for questions and answers here in a little bit, but I have a couple more things I want to touch on first. Again, the National Education Association. They have put out this graph, which is the learning curve of life, they call it. And it very vividly shows and illustrates what we're dealing with here. Because from birth, until the age of five, we learn at a phenomenal rate of speed. We are all, every one of us, born with a photographic recall memory. We are born with that. Every one of us possesses that. And we use it almost exclusively as a natural, automatic way to learn during this period of time from zero to age five until what time, what happens at age five? We go to school. <laughs> From that point on, and remember, these are National Education Association graphs. From that point on, the learning curve goes down the rest of our lives. Not when we complete school, when we start school. The reason is we're taught a rote memory system of learning. We're now going to be taught when we go to school how to learn. My gosh, folks, we already knew how to learn. We had a beautiful way to learn. We were born with it. We learned some of the most exciting, most difficult things in our lives prior to going to school. And we learned it with total accuracy. And you can prove that so easily. Take a preschool child read something to them today and a month from now come back and read the same thing to them and make a mistake somewhere. Boy, they'll point that route right now, right now. They may, may, they may not even know how to read yet. They just heard it once. We all possess that ability, but we get programmed out of using it when we go to school and get into this structured method of learning called the rote memory system of learning because that system of learning is based upon reading as its primary vehicle and everything that we are dealing with in that learning system is dealt with on a conscious basis. We're trying to educate 
10% maybe of our mind's potential in the most inefficient part of the whole brain, the conscious part. And we spend years doing that with a vehicle of reading, which as you saw before is, is pathetic. It may be fun to, to read for some people as a pleasure reader, but we'll show you a much better way to even use this tool, subliminal photography, for that purpose. If you'll photograph your book that you're going to read for pleasure first, you'll put it all directly into the subconscious part of the brain at a hundred times the impact of reading, and then as you go back and read your book for pleasure, it triggers it to the conscious level completely with total understanding. It's as if you're living the book in a, on a basis that you would never get from reading it one time through and with 100% retention. You never forget it. So you'll enjoy the book much more and gosh, it'll take you another three minutes to photograph the book of 360 pages before you read it. So it's not any big deal, is what I'm saying. Now, the educational system itself has really turned their backs up to now on this process. It's really unfortunate because we tested this in the Phoenix Elementary School Districts clear back in 1977. We went into the system, we, we had their um, district staff go through, 22 grade school principals go through, reading teachers, special ed teachers, and then those people handpicked three students out of each school. Underachiever, average student, excelling student all pre-tested to find out what their grade levels were in all their subjects. We had a tremendous variety of IQs. We had a tremendous variety of learning disabilities represented. We had a tremendous variety of socioeconomic backgrounds represented. We worked with those children for three hours a day for five days during one school week, 15 total hours, with this process. Then we turned it over to them to use on their own in conjunction with a study hall with their own materials for the next 10 days approximately an hour a day they were using the process. At the end of those 15 total days, they were then post-tested in the areas of English, vocabulary, and reading skills. Collectively, they jumped an average of six and a half grade years in 15 days. In the areas of math and science, the more technical fields, an average of four and a half grade years in 15 days. It had no bearing on learning disabilities. It had no bearing on socioeconomic backgrounds. None of those things came into play. IQ was irrelevant. This whole process brings IQ up anyway, but we're, we're not even concerned with that. I think IQ is a joke to begin with. Uh, the University of Santa Clara has wanted to measure how much this process increases IQ for quite a few years, and I've refused to do that simply because I don't care. I really could care less. Lozanov has his, uh, his measured and it brought up IQs dramatically. Well, we're dealing with 100 to 200 times the speed of Lozanov and we're dealing with no crutches. We don't require music. We don't require a special, special atmosphere. We don't require anything but you and the book. That's it. And by the way, we've had two of Lozanov's hand-trained people from Europe go through the course and they have told us this. Or we're way beyond what they're doing. Um, Just to give you an idea, I've been really kind of dealing with this so far on the basis of the use of subliminal photography and the learning process. There's so much more. I mentioned over 350 different applications. The part of the brain we're tapping into and teaching you to get directly in touch with, and by the way, this is all transferred from our instructors directly to you. There are no crutches involved. There's no tapes involved. There's nothing. Uh, that you need from us other than just passing this information to you so you can do it on your own. You'll gain control of your life on a basis you've never dreamed of before by using this process daily. The part of the brain you're dealing with is extremely programmable. As a matter of fact, in it lies all of the experiences, the data, the information that you have ever accumulated since at least the time of birth. And through it, through the conduit of this part of the brain, you're accessing literally universal knowledge, everything that's out there. And this isn't just happening for one or two people. It's happening for hundreds and thousands of people that have gone through this. It's not happening for some that aren't using it. 
And we have both of those in this audience, I know, because we've had a lot of people from Global Science that have gone through the course. But the ones that are using it are having those results. And it's changing their lives quite dramatically. Automatic byproducts of this process, awareness, perception levels raised quite dramatically, seven to 10 times the norm. Accelerated learning, 50 to 100 times the average. A need for less sleep, much higher energy level, much better organization, much higher productivity. We see meteoric rises of people in their businesses, in their industries, in their athletic endeavors using this process, using the direct programming in, because the direct programming into this part of the brain is very different from hypnosis. It's very different from any other mind discipline out there on the planet. And how do I know that? Number one, not because I took all these other mind disciplines and went through them, I haven't. On purpose, by the way. Dr. Otto suggested that I did not, that I develop this unto itself, which I have done. But the fact is, we've had people that are 30-year clinical hypnotists. We've had people that have taught TM for years. We've had uh, NLP practitioners from all over the world come through this. We've had uh, literally every other mind discipline involved on the planet come through this course and what they almost tell us to the person is, this is quicker, it's simpler, there are many more applications, and we get to a different feeling and set in the mind than we have ever reached with the others. Now, it's not a deeper one, a different one. And that's even been able to be measured. I don't know how many people in the room are familiar with a machine called a mind mirror, but the mind mirror was developed in England maybe a dozen years ago or so. And I call it a very sophisticated biofeedback machine. What it basically does is it measures all the four levels of brain activity, alpha, beta, theta, and delta, simultaneously as someone is doing any particular activity. And they've measured thousands and thousands and thousands of different activities that people would be doing with, with a hookup to the machine to see, in fact, what parts of consciousness they are activating and to what degree. When you hook a person up to the machine when they're subliminally photographing, it's the only time they have ever seen this, and it's very consistent. We've done it with many other machines, different locations, different people involved, and so on. It's the only time they have ever seen all four levels, alpha, beta, theta, and delta, activated to the maximum capacity on the machine simultaneously. And when you complete subliminal photography, it stops. It drops off. When you continue on, it comes right back on. Something different is happening in the brain dealing with this specific part of it. There is much to learn. I mean, we absolutely are just barely beginning to discover what we're capable of doing. But the answers all are here. We've been told that for literally since the beginning of time. And, and it's recorded by some people that we kind of look upon as maybe knowing what they're talking about, like Jesus and a few others. But the fact is, do we believe it? Do we really think we have the abilities that, say, Jesus had? Sure, we better, because we do. And he's the first one that told us that. And in fact, he went on to tell us we have a lot more. And we're just beginning to find out what we're capable of. This whole global science uh, convention is pointing out a multitude of ways that we can advance ourselves.
and what we're learning about ourselves and the capabilities of ourselves. This is just one aspect of it. But I submit to you this is a very basic aspect of it. Because once you know how to assimilate information at this speed, retain it totally, have it available to you when you need it, it allows you to keep up and accelerate with what's going on on this planet today. It is now a physical impossibility to read in the conventional manner or even speed read and keep up with what's going on in today's world. Even in one area that we might want to really zero in on, let alone all the areas we might want to zero in on, it's a physical impossibility. Subliminal photography can do it. By the way, we didn't stop with Larry Mapers' 606,000 words a minute physically turning pages, and I won't dwell on this much more, but we went to Arizona State University Psychology Department, used a machine called a Tatistoscope, which flashes information on a screen at subliminal speeds and cranked it up to its maximum capacity of 40 milliseconds with full pages of written print that calculated out to over 2 million words a minute. And our students, who had experienced subliminal photography in the high speeds of page turning, were still getting an 85 to 95 percent instant verbal and, and written recall of that information. The control groups from off the campus that were used that had not experienced subliminal photography were running a 12 percent accuracy rate, actually less than guessing. And we didn't stop with just words. We went to maps, graphs, math, all types of different material and found that there was no exception whatsoever. We've had people from literally all walks of life go through this and use this very successful. Scientific community, uh, certainly uh, the electronics industry, doctors, attorneys, dentists, um, judges, uh, military, uh, many students, uh, many educators across the country, people from literally all walks of life. The way this course is taught, we do not alienate anyone, and that's, that's pretty nice. There, there's nothing in this course that will will offend anyone, anybody at all or, or get them uh, their brow all curled up. The, um, very quickly, uh, let's talk about just children, learning disabilities. And it isn't only children, by the way. Masses of adults have learning disabilities. Uh, about one in four people in this country are dyslexic, for one thing. One form or another, there are seven different types of dyslexia. We work with dyslexics, we work with attention disorder deficit children who simply cannot adjust into this method of learning that's being taught to them in the school systems. It's a physical impossibility for them to deal with it. But our process completely bypasses it. We are now going into the Baltimore, Maryland a school district, we're finally making some inroads. We've already taught this in Council Bluffs, Iowa, to the learning disabled there. Half-page newspaper article written after just one semester. Kids that were C and D students in special ed curriculums being written off by the regular school system in one semester had collectively jumped out of the special ed curriculum totally and into the regular curriculums and were A and B students in the regular curriculums in just one semester. It's the method they're being taught to learn with, not the kids.